appearances and intense descriptions. The novel, being a suspense novel, seeks to create a very intense atmosphere within itself. And this is done in a variety of ways. One method is by keeping the range of characters very, very tight. We encounter few people outside of the direct family groups of the Floyds, specifically then Aurora and Archibald. Um, John Mellish has no family. We um, are introduced to a very few servants indeed. Um, then there's Talbot Bulstrode, Aurora's former love interest, and her cousin Lucy. Additional characters are Mrs. Alexander and Mrs. Powell, um, but we see very little of other characters. A little bit we meet characters with whom they socialise, but the drama is held within this close circle. Uh, Conyers, of course, introduced, and Stephen Hargraves, Hargraves who are important to the plot and the secret within the plot. Um, but their emotions are very little described to us. It's much more about the intensity of emotions of Aurora, John Mellish, Talbot Bulstrode, and Lucy. The emotions are close, closely and minutely described, and the psychology of the emotions allies accurately with the type of character that has been introduced earlier on in the novel. So as different individual characters experience different emotions, different crises, different levels of stress, their emotionality continues um, in consonance with who it is that the reader understands them to be. This is, is very well done, it is very consistent. Additionally, the settings for these characters are very intensely and closely described. The novel takes place in really a few locations um, and it's held for quite long periods of time in especially the location of Mellish Park, to some extent Stant Falden Woods, or to a lesser extent Falden Woods. Falden Woods is an important location in the novel. London features and also the, the town near to Mellish Park uh, a little bit is, is featured also to facilitate the, the plot and the unravelling of the secret. The locations where the novel is set are also very vividly described. Felden Woods and the descriptions of Felden Woods has already been discussed earlier. Mellish Park um, comes alive quite vividly for the reader. There are very precise descriptions of the house and the way the house is laid out. We have a clear idea of the, the drawing room, the size of the drawing room, that there's an, an air that the drawing room is quite capacious, and that there are areas that one can be in the drawing room where other people can't see uh, what's happening exactly. Um, we have described John's study very clearly, the veranda outside um, his study, the creeping plants uh, that cover the um, house, also the windows even down to the fact that the windows are opened and closed daily. Um, the house is very open actually. Uh, there's a lot of coming and going, there's a lot of freedom of movement and freedom of air in, in the house, which is, again, that is by contrast with this locked in close secret that Aurora holds within herself. It's so out of context and out of keeping with the environment that she finds herself in. Um, and this is, again, another way in which the author is creating drama. The gardens are vividly described, the, the plants, the geraniums, the flower garden, the white roses, um, the uh, climbing roses as well, it's all very vivid. The woods beside, the pond, the walks through the woods. This luxuriant description of the setting in which the characters live helps to make them more real for the 
uh, reader, it's quite film-like in a way. It's very, although it's obviously a literary form, it's very, very visually described. It's quite pre-Raphaelite in the intensity of the descriptions. Um, you can look at one or two, uh, for example, there's the very vivid description of John and Aurora's sitting room in chapter uh, 25. Um, Mrs. Mellish's bedroom, a comfortable and roomy apartment with a low ceiling and deep bay windows, opened into a morning room in which it was John's habit to read the newspapers and sporting periodicals while his wife wrote letters drew pencil sketches of dogs and horses, or played with her favourite bower. They had been very childish and idle and happy in this pretty chintz-hung chamber, and going into it tonight in utter desolation of heart, Mr Mellish felt his sorrows all the more bitterly for the remembrance of those bygone joys. The shaded lamp was lighted on the Morocco-covered writing table, and glimmered softly on the picture frames, caressing the pretty modern paintings, the simple domestic story pictures, which adorned the subdued grey grey walls. This wing of the old house had been refurnished by Aurora, and there was not a chair or a table in the room that had not been chosen by John Mellish with a special view to the comfort and pleasure of his wife. The upholsterer had found him a liberal employer, the painter and the sculptor a noble patron. He had walked around the Royal Academy with a catalogue and a pencil in his hand, choosing all the pretty pictures for the ornamentation of his wife's room. A lady in a scarlet riding habit and three-cornered beaver hat, a white pony and a pack of greyhounds, a bit of stone terrace and sloping turf, a flower bed and a fountain made poor John's idea of a pretty picture. And he had half a dozen variations of such familiar subjects in this spacious mansion. He sat down tonight and looked hopelessly round the pleasant chamber, wondering whether Aurora and he would ever be happy again, wondering if this dark, mysterious, storm-threatening cloud would ever pass from the horizon of his life and leave the future bright and clear. And that description of their sitting room uh, carries both the physical um, vividness of uh, the narrator's touch in the novel, um, as well as, of course, um, melding it with John's inner life, his uh, emotions. And again, the way in which he is reacting and responding to the room and reminiscing about how the room has been created is in keeping with the character um, whom the, novel, the, the reader has, has grown to, to know through the course of the novel thus far. There are other uh, more straightforward descriptions, um, for example, just simply talking about uh, Within the long, low-roofed drawing room at Mellish Park, there was a snug little apartment hung with innocent rosebud sprinkle, sprinkled chintzes and furnished with maple wood chairs and tables. Um, it's just, it's quite simple, but everywhere the, uh, the text is peppered with these close descriptions of the appearance of, of the house and the garden. Each character's appearance is also very graphically described. We've discussed already quite a lot how Aurora's person ha is described and the sorts of metaphors that are used around her, the appearance of the gypsy foreigner or the regal foreigner, the Cleopatra or Serena Maid. Um, Hecate is another um, classical uh, witch whom Aurora is likened to uh, as the story progresses and as the intensity of the mystery and drama around her in intense, um, grows to a crescendo. Um, there is infused later in the novel um, this doubt about whether or not Aurora has moved over into criminal activity and this slightly darker type of metaphor for her describing her like Hecate is um, part of all of that.
Aurora took up a shawl that she had flung upon the sofa and threw it lightly over her head, veiling herself with a cloud of black lace, through which the restless shivering diamonds shone out like stars in a midnight sky. She looked like Hecate as she stood on the threshold of the French window, lingering for a moment with a deep laid purpose in her heart and a resolute light in her eyes. So with the events that immediately succeed this scene and the way in which Aurora's mental state and uh, physical appearance are described at, at this moment is one of the ways in which the author uh, creates this ambivalence within the reader about, about Aurora. Is she um, desperate enough? Is she self-willed and um, personally ambitious not quite the right word but so so per personally attached to her status and her marriage and her life that she is prepared to transgress at the highest moral level of, of committing murder. As well um, there's a different nuance to these descriptions of, of um, Aurora's darkness when the descriptions are uh, connected with Stephen Hargraves, the, 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 known as the softy in the story. Um, and his way of interpreting her beauty, his way of seeing her, which is, is justified um, really to some extent. Um, so. So no, he, he could not surrender such a sum of money to the Doncaster pawnbroker, even for the possession of his heart's desire. And as the stern money lender refused to take payment in weekly instalments of sixpences, Stephen was fain to go without the gun and to hope that some, other, some day or other Mr John Mellish would reward his services by the gift of some disused fowling piece by Forsyth or Mountain. But there was no hope of such happiness now. A new dynasty reigned at Mellish Park, and a black-eyed queen who hated him had forbidden him to sully her domain with the traces of his shambling foot. So here this, this proud, regal, foreign aspect of Aurora takes on a, a more spiteful aspect, um, something, yeah, exactly that, it's more spiteful. Uh, so. Again, this is one of the ways in which the author sometimes uses the dark foreignness of Aurora in in relatively positive way, except that foreignness was was never entirely positive in these kind of suspense novels. There was always that aura or element of foreign as in strange, um, that, that French sense of foreign, étranger, étrange, strange. Um, and therefore potentially deviant. In certain passages like that one, those descriptions move, take on an even darker nuance. Uh, and the, 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 the author, Mary Braddon, veers between the two. It keeps the, 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 the reader guessing all the time about who Aurora is exactly. So it's worth bearing in mind about at this point as well that this prejudice about um, that which is foreign, that which is different, is constructed by the author within the novel. It might very well have been a social prejudice at the period, but the author is perpetuating it, and the author is omnipotent within the story, and therefore creates and chooses to create this aspect, aspect and element of the world that she's describing. And I think that that's significant when we think as well about um, Stephen Hargraves and how he's described, um, or also referred to as the softy in the novel. Um, the softy Is, is physically not an attractive character um, and may um, have been more repellent to the 19th century 
uh, reader less uh, perhaps um, educated about the nature of physical disability than the modern day reader. Um, we feel some sympathy for the softy with regard to the way in which he is um, treated by his employer after John Mellish um, Conyers. Um, Conyers does humiliate the softy, um, he does taunt the softy and expect things of him that he's not really entirely capable of doing. The Stephen Hargraves is um, cruel to animals um, and that uh, results in or occasions the horse, horse whipping scene um, with, with Aurora and as a result his dismissal from Mellish Park. And as Stephen Hargraves himself says, he um, had worked there for um, almost 40 years. Um, and this is very, very harsh, that he would suddenly find himself um, thrown out of where he lives as someone who's physically vulnerable, mentally vulnerable. He's thrown out of where he, li he lives, he loses all his security, um, both his home and his livelihood, um, as a result of the incident with Aurora. Yes, ma'am, Muster Mellish did turn me out of the house I'd lived in, man and boy, nigh upon forty year. But I've got a new police, police now, and my new master sent me to you with a letter. Um, that's uh, S S Stephen Hargraves speaking to Aurora in chapter 17. Ultimately, though, Stephen Hargraves is revealed as vicious in the novel. Um, and it is made clear that he had sufficient mental capacity to deliberately uh, construct um, a, a, a plot and a trap um, that was highly criminal. Of course the circumstances of his life had been very hard, uh, but the novel ultimately does not have sympathy for Stephen Hargraves. And the idea that someone who um, is mentally disabled or physically disabled might uh, tend towards criminal behaviour is set up earlier in the novel when one of the other um, servants at Mellish Park says that all, all disabled people are... Um, Vicious, he says, them softies is Alice Vicious, which is chapter 14. Um, and again, the point needs to be made that whilst this prejudice may have existed in the 19th century, um, the author is omnipotent in telling the story and chooses to perpetuate this kind of idea, this kind of, um, well, prejudice. Um, uh, and also d discrimination towards the um, inner person. Conyers, um, as a character, is by contrast, of course, with the with the softy. He is beautiful and chill. He is described with the extraordinary level of good looks that seem to um, mirror a Greek god, perhaps Endymion. Um, and he's compared to sort of historically beautiful characters um, throughout the novel. He is really beautiful, but he's also brutish, spiteful, conniving, deceitful. All, all things that are bad. So we have this contrast of um, the disabled Steve, Stephen Hargraves, who is fundamentally underlyingly bad, and also the incredibly physically beautiful Conyers, who is underlyingly bad. It's worth 
as well taking a cross-reference between Conyers and Aurora and thinking about the way in which there is something dubious and foreign about Aurora's beauty. There is nothing dubious or foreign in Conyers' beauty. But the way in which it's constantly hinted that Aurora, because of being different, because of being allied to the spangles and the sawdust, um, because of perhaps having had um, a foreign, literally, you know, foreign grandmother, um, that she will have a tendency to be immoral. The story, of course, Aurora is the heroine. The story, of course, ultimately clears Aurora of doing or any misdeed. It doesn't clear her, of course, of having acted foolishly, of having acted impetuously, um, and having made mistakes in her young life. Um, and for the Victorians, extremely serious mistakes. Um, but she's not criminal, and that's the important point. She's not either vicious or deceitful. Although she holds a secret for a long time um, towards John, she doesn't make up any stories around the secret. She's got a secret, and if he doesn't want her to lie about anything, then he needs to ask her no more questions about the secret. She can't tell him anything beyond the fact that there is a secret, and if he wishes to have answers to questions, all she can do is lie. Um, and so he steps away from that as well. So she's very honest about the fact that she has a secret, in fact. Um, and she generally does tend to speak her mind and also to um, act according to what she thinks at the time will, will, will be the best. So where a woman is beautiful, um, there is perhaps the trace, that there is perhaps the likelihood that she is very beautiful but behind that lies e evil. And we see that in fairy tales such as Snow White and the, uh, the, the, the Vicious Queen and Snow White. Um, even I think Cinderella's stepmother is supposed to be quite beautiful. She wins Cinderella's father um, into a second marriage. Whereas with men in fairy tales and in stories, when they are extremely handsome and extremely good looking, there's very rarely any evil intent behind them. So I do wonder whether, once again, Mary Braddon is trying to explode the traditional fairy tale here just a little bit. Aurora is additionally, um, in, by contemporary critics, um, referred to or described as being in some ways masculine. And that's probably a description that the modern reader would find rather startling, rather surprising. After all, isn't Aurora so completely feminine? Um, as, as said before, she's very impetuous um, and she's clearly very attractive and at ease and at home with her own uh, attractiveness, her own prettiness and her ability to be alluring. That was um, as well discussed earlier. There are multiple um, descriptions of Aurora's dress, her hair, her hair, whether it be tied up and sophisticatedly styled, or whether it be the blackness of her beautiful tresses sprawled out against a pure white pillow. Um, these very sensual, very womanly, because it's long, black hair. Um, it's a very, very sort of frequently there throughout the text, reminding us of her femininity. Um, you know, de depictions, for example, of her her dress we have here, quite late on in the novel, chapter 23. Um, Aurora went down to the drawing room an hour after this. Gor or Aurora went down to the drawing room an hour after this. Gorgeous in maize coloured silk and voluminous flouncing of black lace, with her hair plaited in a diadem upon her head and fastened with three diamond stars which John had bought for her in the Rue de la Paix, and which were cunningly fixed upon wire springs that caused them to vibrate with every chance movement of her beautiful head. So it's very, very feminine. 
it, it's a little bit like pages out of the Hello magazine. You know, Mary Braddon hasn't got the photographs, but you can see, um, you know, some little baubles be <laughs> being pictured in Hello magazine, and then you know the wonderful love story behind them being told. These are the beautiful people. They are the beautiful people going through these troubled and difficult storms, but with all of these wonderfully uh, uh, vivid and um, copious emotions to help them through, and all these as well very beautiful possessions for them to be uh, set amongst during the course of their troubles. Um, it's, a, it's a very artificial world. But even at the height of her troubles, when Aurora is, is taking flight and leaving Mellish Park, there's an emphasis on the clothing and the dress that she's wearing. Um, so she unlocked the door and ran upstairs to her own rooms. There was no one in the dressing room, but her maid was in the bedroom arranging some dresses in a huge wardrobe. Aurora selected her plainest bonnet and a large grey cloak and quietly put them on before a cheval glass in one of the pretty French windows. So, so again, um, how Aurora dresses, the choices that she makes about her clothes are very important, even in a moment of crisis. Of course, she's hoping to travel incognito. Um, but the author feels the importance of describing her clothes. Again, it's all very feminine. Yet, as I say, um, contemporary critics um, describe Aurora um, at points as masculine. And this is from the Athenaeum review of the novel published by um, Tinsley Brothers in 1863, as opposed to the um, serial publication in the Temple Bar Journal the year before. Um, it says, Aurora is a passionate, willful creature, acting solely on impulses and not always the right ones, who is continually getting into scrapes, but in spite of all her faults, her masculine manners, her low tastes, her violent temper, Aurora is a woman, not a fiend nor a maniac, but a warm-hearted, generous, loving woman with an earnest desire to do what is honourable and just and true. So I think um, that this description actually is very accurate, uh, except perhaps for the masculine. Um, but it does as well convey the vividness and the warmth um, of description with which Mary Braddon has created the character Aurora. She does come forward as this very full-blooded, um, highly emotional, highly intelligent as well, um, and generous-hearted woman. It is a vivid description, and it brings forward, although Aurora is a dramatic character, and a character with certain Gothic characteristics being a suspense novel, there is something very alive about her, something quite tangible about her, even if it's difficult to say that she's an entirely realistic character. But she obviously, um, she obviously evokes certain triggers in terms of the depiction of the archetype. Um, and that is done effectively enough that for the reader, and even for today's reader, um, a sense of this archetypal woman uh, becomes clear and substantial to the reader. What, though, uh, is driving this idea in the um, 19th century uh, interpretation of Aurora that she is masculine? And I think the main thing, that well, there is a number of things driving it. Um, it's partly within her temperament that she is so emotionally autonomous, that she is so self-willed, that she is so determined to have her own private life and to be in command and in possession of her private life, despite the fact that she is a married woman, and therefore essentially in the power of her husband.